Can we all sit down, please? Right, uh, last panel of the day, welcome back. Um, human safety and sustainable security. We're very fortunate to have Fred Guttel, the executive editor of Scientific American and author of The Fate of the Species. Sounds like a very important read. <laughs> a lighthearted romp. <laughs> <laughs> Which will be published by Bloomsbury in May. Scientific American helps its millions of readers understand these critical issues, and I'm delighted that Mr. Gutel can chair this session. I, in fact, shared a personal memory with him earlier, not uh, uh, relating to Scientific American, because in my long lost youth, I interned at an organization that distributed Scientific American in Europe, and it was just before going to university to read science. And that magazine was a very important part of my scientific education because the problem with education in the UK is it's highly specialized. You do one science, or I did, and that magazine uh, gave me a much broader background for which I'm very, very grateful. When asked how I got from chemistry into finance, the answer is as quickly as possible, but that's another matter. <laughs> well, th thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, the organizers and uh, supporters of this conference for uh, putting it together and inviting us. Um, we at Scientific American are uh, proud to be a media sponsor <laughs> or a media supporter or whatever, we, whatever, whatever it is we are. Uh, we're, we're happy to be here. Um, and I, 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 it's a beautiful sunny day and we're inside talking about this very gloomy subject. And I, I really wish that I had a good joke to start us off, but, but I, don't, I, I don't. So uh, I think you might have to just take me out and have me shot afterwards, perhaps. Um, I, I wanted to start, um, before we get to our uh, very exciting panel here, uh, I, I wanted to just sort of set, a, set this sort of tone for what, what is at stake here. And I think that it, it, it's, uh, uh, we, we all know what's at stake, but we, it, it's, it's often talked around. Um, so I wanted to talk right at it a little bit. And I, um, I, was, uh, I was interviewing uh, a while ago an ecologist who uh, was doing very interesting work on uh, doing computer simulations of uh, food webs in which, these are ancient food webs in which hunter-gatherers had actually been involved. And, uh, what was really interesting is that it was a it was a it was a food web that involved humans, um, and that that's what we were chatting about. And then we sort of got off topic, and we talked about uh, how quickly the world is growing. And um, you know, I was telling her that when I when my um, when my father was born, there were roughly two billion people on the planet. When I was born, there were about three billion. Um, my daughter was born, there were five and a half billion. Now there are seven billion, and the UN is projecting um, uh, a uh, topping off at nine or ten billion. And she said something to me that that really, it was an offhanded, casual comment that 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 really kind of shook me up a little bit. And I'm going to read it to you. Um, she said, "When I'm putting my ecologist hat on, the human population is not going to stay at nine or ten billion because no population does." Populations don't do steady state. They don't stay at one level for a long period of time. They go up and down. They cycle. And sometimes they crash, and the crash can be very big, especially if you pr prop yourselves up in artificial ways or gain your population gro growth in unsustain unsustainable means. And um, 
I mean, this is a very sobering statement, um, and it's you know it's one thing to talk that way about uh, yeast in a petri dish or or uh, gerbils or or you know, uh, seagulls or something, but it's another thing to talk about that uh, that way about a human population, which um, and and it's it's it it it's one of the things that that um, sent me off into this direction that that. Uh, the, uh, the result of which was this book called Fate of the Species, which you can pre-order on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> sorry. My publicist made me say that. Um, but I wanted to, um, so uh, w when we think about climate, um, and, and we, we've talked a lot about climate today, and I'm not going to repeat what, what we've said, but, but I, I think sometimes, um, uh, what what is not said about climate is how fundamental a change uh, uh, the the introduction of the amounts of, CO, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that we've been producing, and it's it's really uh, it, it's on a planetary scale, and it's on it's on it's a, it's a it's a huge um, geochemical change uh, to 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 the makeup of the planet, and. It's similar in scale to things that have been observed in the fossil record going back, uh, going back to the uh, the first uh, uh, microbes that that could do photosynthesis two and a half billion years ago. It's similar in scale to the uh, uh, scale and, and rapidity of uh, 600 the end Permian extinction 600 million years ago, which involved big releases of carbon dioxide from coal. Ironically, um, and it, it's it's serious stuff, and and it, it it I think this is the backdrop for everything that we're talking about. Uh, you know, we've got all we've got this happening, and and life on the planet has gotten is more vulnerable as a result. Um, but this all sounds like it's you know it's we're talking about geological timescales here. So what? Why worry? This is, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, these are hum human time scales is what we're concerned with. But actually, um, you know, we're not necessarily talking about geological time scales because, um, uh, you know, when you go back and you look at the fossil record, the fossil record is a very thick magic marker. You can't, can't really see how quickly things happen. Um, and uh, there are a number of ways, there are a number of things that could possibly happen. And this is, now this isn't science, this is the kind of things that scientists worry about. So it's not, I'm not, you know, making any, I'm not telling you about a study or anything like that. But, um, but you know, we're talking about things like, um, like, well, climate change, climate change could be rapid. And uh, uh, I, I know that um, uh, James Hansen has talked about uh, tipping point at which, um, you know, the, the planet would start getting hotter and hotter. Um, and uh, that sounds like something that, you know, still could happen slowly over decades or century. Um, but some other scientists have been poking into things that, in ways in which, the, in smaller ways in which the atmosphere, the atmosphere and the ocean circulations are nonlinear, meaning they could change rapidly. Um, um, and, uh, you know, these are things like monsoons and ocean currents and El Nino and weather patterns and um, uh, rainforests and, and that's, that sort of thing. So you can, you can get these tipping points theoretically that could cause things to change very, very rapidly. Um, now, this is, not a, this is not an observation. I mean, you can sense this a little bit, but this is not a I just want to stress this is not a scientific observation. These are ideas, but they're scary ideas. Um, I think um, uh, another 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 example of things that uh, you know that that could that could get out of hand are is, is species extinction. I mean, we we've you know species are dying off um, at rates that alarm many scientists, um, and people talk about the possibility of a mass extinction event, which uh, uh, some of these uh, things that I mentioned happening a long time ago. Um, <laughs> were mass extinction events, and they were often triggered by uh, geochemical changes on the planet. And uh, people talk about us being in the middle of one. There's no proof that we're in the middle of one. We don't really know. But um, if we were, um, 
it's not something that we can really just hunker down and weather because it affects everything is everything is related. Um, we rely on agriculture um, to, to feed ourselves, and agriculture relies on bees to pollinate trees, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another, another thing that we need to think about is are things like uh, uh, disease. Um, uh, and this is really, you're going to really, you're going to take me out and have me shot after this, I can tell. It's just this. But um, uh, things that, even things that seem um, uh, kind of ordinary, like flu, um, the 2009 pandemic completely caught uh, uh, virologists and health officials by surprise. I mean, they, they just did not see that coming. And, and thankfully, it was mild, but it, could, it, it may not have been mild. Um, and we've got bird flu now, which is also very worrying. Um, uh, and uh, bird flu uh, has been shown, been shown to, for the few people who caught it, to have a very high mortality rate for humans. doesn't mean that if it became a human disease, it would still have a high mortality. That's a subject of great debate. Um, but that's it's another one of these worrying things. Um, and la finally, just, uh, we, we, you know, uh, we've mentioned um, uh, cyber, um, uh, our vulnerabil vulnerability to cyber attack and things like that. That's a very real concern, too, because we're very dependent on machines. We're very dependent on the internet, um, for example. Uh, you know, the, the internet is, uh, really the, the, uh, a pillar of our global economy. And yet it was designed, the last thing in mind for the people who designed the internet was security. Um, and security is kind of something that we've had to sort of catch up to. And at the same time, we've now invented these um, highly autonomous software programs. Uh, Stuxnet is a prime example. Uh, Stuxnet is the kind of software that you would put on a Mars Landers that, that could it's the Jason Bourne of software you send it out and it that makes decisions by itself and uh, is highly autonomous um, th this is this kind of thing could come back um, and, and and bite us so what do we do about all this how do we how do we keep all this from blowing up in our faces uh, how do we keep our population in in a steady state which I think is what we want and uh, uh, you know, I guess another way to think of it is we're going to have to try to beat the odds. And um, how, how do we do that? Well, this is where I turn to our very distinguished panel here. They're going to tell us how, uh, I hope. Um, but I think, that, um, I, I think that whatever we do, we're, we're just going to have to be very clever. Um, I don't think there's really any going back uh, to a simpler world. Um, uh, I think we're going to have to be um, exceedingly clever about about the decisions that we make and the technologies that we that we um, that we introduce. Okay. Well, now I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Wolfgang Lutz, uh, founded the um, Wittgenstein Center, or was one of the founders of the Witt Wittgenstein Center, which is uh, he's a demographer, and he um, his uh, he can what he'll do. Uh, what I'm, uh, is talk about population in a way that is far more nuanced than, than the way I can talk about population. Um, uh, Wolfgang is, uh, studies human capital formation, which, and, and, and the basic difference here from, from, from our conversations is that uh, uh, um, when we talk about population, we tend to talk about uh, uh, people, all these new people, oh my goodness, the population is rising as, as li liabilities. And Wolfgang looks at them as opportunities if we, if we educate them and we do the right things. So without any further delay, I'll, I'll give you Wolfgang, who will give, you a, um, who will, who will give us an uplifting uh, experience here. Thank you, Fred, for the kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here, part of this exciting meeting. I'm only going to talk about one species, and that's called Homo sapiens. And uh, I'm a demographer. I <laughs> tend to say demographer. We do the mathematics of people in all its dimensions. So it's not just the numbers, but it's also the change in composition with different uh, by age, gender, level of education, or whatever. And as Fred has already said, I'm not only going to look at population, as it usually said, as a liability, how many mouths to feed, but the same people have all the hands to work, they have 
brains to think, and, and that's what we all depend on. So it's the human capital at the same time as people that have rights and uh, are liable. So uh, we see a world population and global human capital. Let's see whether this works. Yes. What you see here on this slide is not millions of years, but the last 1,000 years, world population size. And you see, until the late uh, 19th century, world population was really at very low levels. The entire population on this planet was less than the U.S. population is today. And it was only then in the 19th century that death rates started to decline and world population, first in Europe and then in the 20th century, all around the world started to increase. And as you know, at the moment, we are around 7 billion people. And what you see here is the uncertainty for the future, for the 21st century. The future actually is still widely open. How can we study the future of population? Well, essentially, we need information about the current population, how many there are, and what's the age structure. And then we made assumptions on essentially three factors. Fertility, that's the birth rates. Mortality, the death rates, or sometimes measured in terms of life expectancy. And migration, if you look at national populations or subpopulations. And all these three Factors are uncertain with respect to the future development, and that's why we really need to do probabilistic population projections. So whenever you see just one line of future population growth, don't believe it. It's very likely to be wrong, because there is a huge range of uncertainty. You see here our probabilistic population projections as we published them in Nature some time ago. You see the red line is the median with half the cases above and the half below, and the Broad area is the 95% uncertainty interval. So you see there is further increase in the population built in until we reach somewhere around 9 billion people when it's likely to stabilize or fall. That's in the medium, but you see there's a chance that we actually will be fewer people than today or that the world population will be above 12 billion. So it's a big uncertainty that essentially depends on the future of the birth rate because fertility has this multiplicative factor. The children have children again, and it's the future course of fertility somewhat together with mortality that determines our future. But the world is very heterogeneous. Here you see Eastern Europe almost certainly going to experience population decline, possibly halving of the population. This is why already the birth rates are very low there and the age structure so that there are very uh, few young people, so fewer people coming into reproductive age. And to many, this is a security concern. The president of Bulgaria calls population decline in his country the single most important security threat of his country. And as you know, President Putin also is quite concerned about what will happen to the Russian population in a security context. The opposite is what we see in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, very rapid population growth. It is likely to triple, if not uh, quadruple, or even increase by a higher factor. And in some countries, we may even see a factor of seven to eight, it's because the birth rates are still very high. So this is the pattern we see today, a demographically divided world. And this is what confuses many commentators. They don't know should we be worried about the population explosion or implosion or aging. Well, everything is happening in a way at the same time, but in different parts of the world in a different manner. That's why we need to have a look. And what I'm going to talk about now, well, this is the 22nd century. In climate change, we really need to look into the 22nd century, and we can draw projections in the very long run. What I want to show here just is that if the world fertility level would converge to something we experience in Europe today, about 1.5 children per woman, or in China, we have the same level, then in the very long run, even with further increasing life expectancies in these simulations up to 120 years, which is very high life expectancy, and scientists are not sure whether we can actually reach it. But if we do so, the world population by the end of the 22nd century, in the very distant future, uh, could be anywhere between 2 and 6 billion people, so much lower than uh, today. And I recently was invited to put this together in an editorial of the Journal of the Royal Statistical Societies, which I gave the provocative title, Towards a World of 2 to 6 Billion Well-Educated and Therefore Healthy and wealthy people, I may have added, living in security and being able to cope with unavoidable climate change. So this is the optimistic scenario, the optimistic vision of what we could still manage on this planet. But this will only function if we uh, 
look, uh, if we invest more in education, and this is what I really found out in 25 years of systems analysis studying in many countries of the world, what are the most important factors triggering this complex interaction between population development and environment. Here you see just a few differentials. Mother's education, if they are uneducated, is the red line. Their infant mortality is much higher than if they have primary education, or the blue is have at least some secondary education. Um, some economists always think it's income that makes the difference. We've looked in very carefully here for India. What is more important? Is it the household wealth or is it the education of the mother? Clearly both matter and uh, better educated and uh, wealthier women do have significantly lower infant mortality, uh, but education is more important than income. That's what the analysis shows. The same is true for fertility. Educated women around the world have lower birth rates uh, than the less educated. Now, when we talk about uh, education and human capital, we should not only think in terms of schooling. We, here, I will show you the figures on formal education, but informal education is equally important. And also, when educationists, they talk about education as the process, the schooling, what do we learn in school, attending school. What we demographers here study is the sort of the stock variable. It's the accumulated consequence of many years of schooling. So it's the slowly changing stock that has a great momentum. And one of the graphs that I really like a lot are these age pyramids. You may have seen them uh, with women on the right and men on the left. And here, and then sorted by age groups, the youngest at the bottom, the oldest on top. And then color is added here to show the education. So this is Korea in 2000. You have the young women are among the best educated women. They're almost half of them have completed college. That's why they're dark blue. But yet their mothers above the age of 60, more than half of them have never been to school. That's faced in red here. Why? How can that be? Well, when they were at school age in the 1950s, Korea was still a very poor developing country. Now, we use demographic methods uh, to reconstruct this. This was Korea in 1970. First of all, you see it's still a very young population because of very high fertility in the past. It's really worse than an African country in a way, this huge bulge there. But then you see they started already educating the young ones, but above the age of 35, almost everything is red. They've never been in school. So this is when Korea started to invest massively in education. And now we go in five year steps, 80, 85, 90, 95. You see how the better educated move up the age pyramid and we can very clearly demonstrate that many of the good things that we are all fond of, like better health and in particular economic growth happens when these better educated cohorts come into the main world working ages, and that is clearly for these Asian tiger countries and for many other countries this can be shown. This is Korea today again, and then we can make projections. You see, it, uh, 2030 Korea is likely to be a very, very well-educated country, but of course with very low fertility. Korea has one of the lowest birth rates in the world today, and this will cause massive population aging. So the challenge here is uh, to sort of compensate the smaller number of young people by their higher education have them more productive, uh, also they are fewer. So this is what many of the European countries are facing, and the, uh, we should not only look at the number of people by age, but also their capabilities and their human capital. That's what our analysis shows, and that's what we also could prove statistically that indeed, once we have this more detailed education breakdown of the population, indeed we can show that human capital is the main driver of economic growth. Here you see a graph for China, China's population from 1970 onwards getting much better educated and also in China following pretty much the trajectory of Korea economic growth is very closely associated with better education of the labor force and then China will start to shrink um, India very different situation they had almost half of the population still uneducated by the same time investing in tertiary education. And for that reason, India will also continue to grow. It has a much younger population and uneducated women have fewer children. This is a worst case scenario for Kenya that they stop building schools. They are not further investing in education. Then the population is exploding again. And uh, actually the number of uneducated would increase because population growth is outpacing uh, the education expansion. And we recently had an article in, in the review uh, here that sh where we showed different scenarios for the world population up to 2050. 
And by different education scenarios that you see here listed in different, uh, the four columns, there could be already by the middle of the century either one billion people more or less on this planet, assuming identical education-specific fertility rates, but only investing more in education or investing less in education. So what I want to say is that education also is the key driver of our demographic future. We don't have time now to discuss. We also had studies where we show that uh, demography education are key drivers of the transition to modern democracies. And we can talk about this later. We apply this to Iran because Iran had this tremendous improvement in education, particularly female education, over the last decades. And given the global statistical association, there is a high probability that Iran would naturally develop into a modern democracy given the human capital development. Well, I think we need further discussions on this, but at least that's what the global association seems to imply. Similarly, with the adaptive capacity to climate change, vulnerability to disasters would be greatly reduced if the population is more educated. Well, I'm wrapping up here. Um, really, uh, increasingly, uh, my studies over 25 years in a very holistic systems oriented sense taught me uh, that education, particularly the universal basic education, including particularly women, is really a key driver of many good things that we want on this planet. And this was the planet as it looked in 1970, which is still in our mind. You have the well-educated, marketing green north, and the uneducated, less educated south. Today, it has already improved a lot. Today, Latin America has educated, East Asia has educated, and only in Africa, we have this pocket of less educated populations. And putting the whole world population together, this was 1970, a huge proportion of the population, particularly women, still completely uneducated. This is our population today, much bigger, but at the same time, much better educated. But we still have this bottom billion who is uneducated, the red one. And this is a scenario for 2050. So as you see, I'm ending on a rather optimistic note. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was really interesting. I, I think the, the solution to all our problems would be to invent an education bomb. Um, my, our, next, our next panelist here needs no introduction. She is Sylvia Earle, who is, she was uh, chief scientist at NOAA, uh, national, I'm not going to say it. Um, that would be good enough for me. But uh, Sylvia Earle is, is, an, is an oceanographer. She's a scientist. She's a lover of uh, nature. She's a rock star, a movie star. She's, uh, she's, she's an evangelist. Oh, so here's Sylvia Earle. <laughs> An education bomb, huh? <laughs> I like it. You know, we already have it, though. We have the internet. We have cell phones. We have hope, because we now can communicate in ways that did not exist when I was a kid, didn't even exist 10 years ago or five. Listen up, Cassandra. <laughs> the antidote to the Cassandra syndrome is exactly what you were just describing. This is. If, you know, if everybody knows what Cassandra knows, either everybody's really depressed, but if everybody knows, everybody's listening because they know what Cassandra knows, that we, we have a problem. We have a planet that's in trouble, and that means we're in trouble. I have really, as a <laughs> blue water, person, spending a lot of time under the sea, on the sea, around the sea, come to witness changes during my lifetime that are frustrating. I feel, the, I feel your pain, Cassandra, <laughs> because having spent thousands of hours under the sea, I try to tell people what it's like and that the changes that have taken place, 90% or so, the big fish gone, coral reefs, about half of them gone or in a state of trouble, the climate change issues, but who's listening? Well, now everyone can. Everyone now has this view of Earth. It didn't exist when I was a kid. Now, journals such as Scientific American, The Economist, are talking about 
the envelope of our life support system, the issues that now face us, that we're pressing the edges of those very things that keep us alive. <laughs> Security. Think of this. Do you like to breathe? I mean, if you do, this is a big security issue. We are influencing the very systems that produce the oxygen, renew the oxygen, refresh the oxygen every day. And in just the last 50 years, the reduction in phytoplankton in the sea that accounts for something on the order of 70% of the oxygen is, um, has, has declined maybe as much as 40% since 1950, 60 years. There are some of my colleagues who love the idea of going to Mars. I think I would like to try that too. And to think about terraforming Mars, to change that red planet to be more like our beloved blue one, to have an atmosphere on Mars more like Earth's atmosphere, 20% oxygen, 80% uh, nitrogen with just enough carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis, a few other trace gases that, that make this planet work in our favor. Meanwhile, we, most of us, are witnessing, all of us are witnessing, some of us are accelerating a Marsiforming of Earth. Terraforming Mars, great idea. Marsiforming Earth, not such a good idea. We have entered what some have referred to as the Anthropozoic, others refer to as the Bulldozerozoic. Whatever it is, we are transforming the land and now transforming as well the sea, bulldozing the ocean with trawls that scrape the ocean floor. And like bulldozers, if they were used to catch songbirds, destroying forests to shake out a few pounds of protein, it would be equivalent to what we're doing in the sea to scrape the ocean floor or to deploy long lines with thousands of hooks, with a bycatch that gets thrown away, often far exceeding the amount that goes actually to market. In our time, we have witnessed pressures that are beyond anything that the planet has seen one species exert on the planet in any time in history. Certainly in the last century, maybe it's two centuries, but I think over the last century, Maybe even in the last 50 years, we have witnessed more change than during all preceding history. The pressures that we're putting on our life support system, not because we want to, but because we haven't known that it mattered. And there's the big unknown, the surprises that are coming along. We can calculate now for the first time in history, the changes in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere we didn't have the power to measure going back 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. Now we can do that. We can measure the amount of plankton in the sea because we have records that enable us to see from a baseline of decades ago to where it is today. We can dive back into time, thanks to the geologists who have that wonderful way of thinking about time. and. This is just a little graph that shows the ups and downs over the last 100,000 years. Only in the last little chunk of the last 100,000 years have things really been kind of stable in our favor. Not coincidentally, it's when the great prosperity of human civilization has taken place, mostly in the last 200 years, as we've heard already. But humanoids have existed long before the last 200 years, last 10,000 years, and certainly the last 200 years. But this is the moment in time for the first time that we can look at these things in perspective and see what we're doing to our little blue speck in the universe, to our life support system. Just how resilient is nature? We don't know. But we do know that much of what we're doing is pushing the envelope. The carbon dioxide is one measurable way that we're pushing the edges of what's tolerable for our species. The destruction of what we see in the sea that's happened in a very remarkably short period of time, a few decades, to lose 90% of the sharks, to see 90% of the tunas, the swordfish, the marlin, the cod, already depressed from the previous 
generations of extracting wildlife from the sea, but an accelerated rate on our watch, the destruction of forests on the land, the undermining of our life support system. So early this year, I went to Midway, halfway across the Pacific. I had a chance to visit with a bird. Her name is Wisdom. She's an albatross. She's 61 years old this year. She's admiring one of her eggs. Actually, she's produced about 50 in her lifetime. It takes about, you know, they have to be teenagers, most of them, before they can start to reproduce, find a mate. And like many humans, or at least some humans, they tend to mate for life. Uh, this albatross is a laysan albatross. Imagine what that bird has seen in her lifetime. Imagine what you've seen in yours. More change than during all preceding history. At the same time, though, we've learned more. This is an albatross from Antarctica. I was there just about a month ago. Again, birds that live a long time have witnessed what we've witnessed, changes that are remarkable. Thing is, they don't know why those changes are taking place. They may realize it, that things aren't the way they were when they were chicks, or when they were teenagers, or when they were 30 years old, but they certainly are experiencing the consequences of these changes. They don't know why, and if they did know why, they wouldn't know what to do about it. The good news is we do know why. We do know what to do about it. The frustrating thing is that it's taking us a while to get our act together to take actions to, to really slow down the process of the melting of polar ice. Bad news for the penguins and the other creatures there. Bad news for us too. And here's the thing, it isn't just climate change. It's also what we are doing to the natural world by what we are extracting from it. And it isn't just trees. It isn't just forests. It isn't just the desertification of formerly productive parts of the land. In the ocean, we are predators of a sort that the ocean has never known before. People think the great white shark is the big dangerous predator. Well, look in the mirror. We are the ones who are extracting on a scale that nothing in the whole systems of the ocean, they have nothing in, in their history that have prepared them for the extraction on a scale that we are now imposing. Krill, these little shrimpy creatures from Antarctica, well, they occur in the Arctic as well. Cornerstone of the, of the life support system there. We have the power, and we're exerting it, not just on krill, but on hundreds of species all over the world. Can you imagine feeding seven billion people, or even one billion people, on wildlife, birds, owls, eagles, creatures from the land, little furry things. Our long ago ancestors did that as hunter-gatherers, but in our time, we must cultivate what we eat or we are going to run out of things to eat. And in the process, we're consuming our life support system. <coughs> Bad news for creatures such as polar bears, what's happening to the climate. Bad news because of what we're taking out of the ocean. Coral reefs, been around for many hundreds of thousands of years and on our watch, about half are missing, gone, or are in a state of decline. Part of it is climate change, global warming. Part of it is our ability to put into the ocean and take out of the ocean things that disrupt the way the world works, the way the ocean works. We got a glimpse of our power to change the nature of nature in 2010. Again, one of those unexpected things with the Deepwater Horizon event that did make history of, of a sort. Nothing like it had happened before, drilling a mile beneath the surface of the ocean and two miles beneath the rocks underneath the surface, the out of control kind of event. Now we know of our power. We also have the power to explore in ways we couldn't. And just yesterday, James Cameron came back from the deepest part of the ocean. Woo-hoo, <laughs> the third person in history to do so. It's been 52 years since two people went and got a 20-minute glimpse of what's in the deepest part of the sea. A dozen people have been to the moon. Hundreds have been up high in the sky. We have yet to explore the ocean with the same kind of attention that we've been putting up into the skies above. What we've done to explore the skies above has paid off handsomely. Our neglect for the ocean 
is costing us dearly. But this is the moment, right now, as never before, we know. Maybe as never again, we have a chance to do something about it. Why I'm glad to be here at this conference? Because it is the time when we can underwrite the security of our species going forward. It should rivet our attention. To quote a friend, Addison Fisher, who, when he heard a talk about the ocean, said, if we fail to take care of the ocean, nothing else matters. If we fail to take care of nature, nothing else matters. Thank you. Very, thank you. That was so. That was so interesting, um, and it's, uh, it's a lot of responsibility. Um, the next, our next uh, panelist is Martin Lees. Um, Martin has been associated with uh, uh, just about every important organization um, I, I, I've ever heard of. He was. Uh, he's been. He and he's. He's known everyone in the field for at least thirty years. Uh, no, I joke. He's. Uh, he's. He's a fun guy to joke around with. Um, he, he was uh, he was work he worked for the OECD. He's been assistant secretary general for the United Nations. He is former secretary general of the Club of Rome, um, and now is working, I believe, as an advisor uh, to to this very large organization called the Chinese government, and also with Mikhail Gorbachev. I told you he's an impressive guy, Martin Lees. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Somebody said they didn't have time to make a good joke. Would you allow me one minute to make a bad joke? Yes, please. Uh, we talk all the time about catastrophe, ladies and gentlemen, and we never define what we mean. And Winston Churchill was once asked this question, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, what's the difference between a catastrophe and a disaster? And Churchill gave a very good answer, but to get the answer, I must just tell you that after the war, he was voted out in favor of a Labour government led by Mr. Attlee, and he didn't like Clement Attlee. So his answer to this question, what's the difference between a disaster and a catastrophe, is he said it's easy to answer that question. If Mr. Attlee fell into the Thames, it would be a disaster, and if somebody fished him out, it would be a catastrophe. <laughs> Anyway, um, I would like to say first that I've had the privilege of working closely with our very inspiring friend Bill Polk, who you saw this morning in preparing this conference. And like many of you, I deeply regret his absence, and I hope we all send him our best wishes for a swift recovery. I'd also like to thank the Carey Foundation, uh, and particularly to acknowledge the visionary role of its late president, Bill Carey, and also to express our thanks to John Rose and his colleagues at the East-West Institute for their strong intellectual inputs and organizational support. Now, early speakers have already made clear that the world today faces a gathering storm of deepening and connected challenges. And if we are to manage these challenges successfully to achieve world security, we have to face up to some fundamental realities. In this short talk, I will simply suggest four. And the first is that we live in a time of human history of massive transformation in our societies, in the world community, and in the natural world. It means that old ideas and entrenched ideas are not going to solve our problems. We need new ideas, new strategies, and institutional innovation if we're to have any chance of preserving the safety and security of our citizens in an increasingly multipolar, interdependent, and uncertain world. And this is the situation today, but the sad truth is nothing we can say today will make any difference for many years. So we have to look into the future, and that's a pretty perilous thing to do. We've heard some projections, and let me give you only one in the sense of this discussion. The population in Afghanistan is roughly 28 million, I'm told. By 2050, it will be 75 million. So we're going from 28 to 75. So whatever our problems may be today, ladies and gentlemen, we have to have the courage to look ahead and be real and think about where we're headed. It's secondly, it's now widely recognized all over the world, 
including in the United States, for example, by such key US institutions as the National Academies of Science and Engineering and the Pentagon and the CIA, that rapid environmental change, intensifying competition for vital resources and increasing inequality constitute real and growing non-traditional threats to economic and political stability and to world security and peace. It is urgent, therefore, to avert these threats and these risks, and particularly those of climate change and ecosystems degradation, which are non-linear and probably irreversible. Uh, Sylvia Earl gave a brilliant presentation. She didn't mention the word acidification of the oceans, but that is one of the most substantial threats because it threatens also to change the whole carbon cycle because these little shrimps that she showed you and other small marine organisms fix carbon in their shells if they can. But if the waters become too acidic, they can't. And then they die, therefore, they don't drop carbon down to the bottom of the ocean and take it out of the atmosphere. That is to say, very quickly, that terrestrial and ocean ecosystems fix half of our emissions. If we destroy ecosystems, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere goes up and climate change accelerates. And when I say non-linear, I will simply explain what that means is that policymakers are universally wrong to imagine that we face something called global warming which is nice and slow and steady, giving us 20 years to negotiate and think about it. The danger is these are non-linear processes, and I can't get into what that means. It means we could have sudden shocks and dramatic change, and scientists are now principally preoccupied to know how close we are to the tipping point when we go over the edge, and then cutting emissions and saying we're sorry will make no difference. So George can illuminate us further on that. But in spite of warning signals which are flooding in from all over the world, it remains the central assumption of economic policy that we must return to our present consumption-driven, resource-intensive strategy for growth, although this will clearly not be sustainable in the longer term for the reasons we have heard. I am not pleading here for zero growth, but as the European Commission has recently underlined, what we need is a new style of sustainable and equitable growth, and this will be the centre of discussions at Rio Plus 20 in June. From this follows my third reality, that we must and we can achieve a new trajectory of resource and energy efficient, low carbon progress, which will generate wealth and employment sufficient to meet the needs and aspirations of 9 billion people and of a growing world population but we have to do this while respecting the environmental and ecological boundaries of this planet. My fourth point, at last, is a positive one, namely that humanity has, never, has enormous capacities to avert these risks and dangerous problems if, I, if only we had the wit to act intelligently to do it. We have vast knowledge and practical experience. We have creativity and skills, scientific, technological and productive potentials and resources of all kinds even money. We found trillions of dollars in a few years to save the banking system. It's not practical to tell us we don't have enough money to help developing countries adapt to climate change. However, we do seem unable to define a positive vision of the future, to agree among ourselves, and to commit determined action to mobilize and direct these vast resources to, set, to secure the future. And if we are to face these realities, we need strong political leadership in the common interest, clear and predictable policies and priorities and incentives combined with the dynamics of private enterprise and with the support and participation of civil society and the public, but we are very far from this today. So if we look ahead to 2035, global food production will have to increase by at least 50% energy production by at least 45% and avail available clean water by 30% if we are to meet the needs of a growing population. But this must all be achieved under increasingly difficult environmental and resource constraints and this is the nature of the problem ahead of us. The many economic, environmental and demographic challenges we fa face are now on a scale which simply cannot be resolved by incremental improvements alone. They demand radical breakthrough solutions, and these must be found soon, 
which can be achieved through human creativity and through increased investment in frontier fields of basic research, such as genomics, nanotechnology, and next generation computing. Fortunately, in most of the areas of research crucial to sustainable development, new solutions are on the horizon. For example, for food and nutrition, health, pollution and emissions control, new energy sources, resource efficient production, low carbon transportation, and energy efficient buildings and infrastructure. What we need is coherent, forward-looking public policy, which should be the catalyst to turn these enormous potentials into reality through increased investment in science and incentives and broad targets for innovation. But besides investing in basic research, we urgently need programs of public and private cooperation and investment to focus applied research on the development of commercially viable solutions and to scale up and disseminate these solutions widely across the world if we are to achieve significant results. So science and technology and innovation offer us great opportunities, but we must also be cautious. Science cannot save us from ourselves, and we know that the solutions we may find and choose in wealthy countries to meet our own conditions are not necessarily easily transferable across the world. So increased investment is a condition for solving our problem in science and technology, but it is by no means sufficient. And the second factor is education, which is crucial. Let me quote what uh, the US Commission on National Security in the 21st century said, which is quite dramatic. Aside from a weapon of mass destruction detonating in an American city, we can think of nothing more dangerous to our national security than the failure to properly manage investment in education, especially in science, math, and technology. It's also urgent to restructure energy systems if we have, are to have any hope of containing the rise of temperature to two degrees and to modernize infrastructure so as to ensure long-term competitiveness and productivity. All these transformations in any nation must be framed within the realities of an interdependent world in rapid transformation. It will be vital to modernize and strengthen international cooperation if we are to achieve concerted action on common threats and truly global issues. Let me conclude by saying a few words about the concept of security. First of all, the issue posed to this conference is of such importance because of the problems I have described to you. How can we face these connected challenges of today and tomorrow to assure human safety and security at affordable cost. And here I would simply say that if we are able to transform our path of growth and our societies onto a new trajectory of sustainable and equitable growth and thus towards world security, then the second question becomes how can we make this affordable? My answer is as follows. First, if we fail to make such a transformation, this will incur immeasurable short-term and longer-term costs to millions of people, to the world economy, and to the global environment. Secondly, the costs of the transition will be real, but they will be small in comparison with the opportunities they will generate for economic progress and world development in the future. In reality, we have no choice. Our present strategy is incurring enormous economic, social, and environmental costs the sooner we act, the cheaper the cost of the transition will be. I can only hope that the United States will choose to mobilize its formidable energies and capacities to contributing to building up a more sustainable, secure and peaceful world for present and future generations and that it will choose to do this before it is too late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was that was terrific. Um, uh, our our last speaker is uh, George Polk. Um, George started out as a uh, a a, a, an, a technology entrepreneur, and he um, he was CEO of the uh, founder and CEO of the Cloud, which is a European uh, broadband wireless network operator, which was sold to Sky. 
And uh, since 2007, he has been uh, working uh, in climate change. And most recently, he founded Project Catalyst, which is an effort to jumpstart low carbon growth plans for countries. And uh, he told me outside here that he's something of a hybrid, a, a, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, but uh, it sounds interesting. So I'll, without, without more <laughs> ado, I'll, I'll let George come explain what he does. I try to be hard to introduce. Um, so I, I'm going to begin by defining myself to you. Um, uh, entrepreneurs are stupid people, and good entrepreneurs are very stupid people. And the reason is that you would not go at, and try to change the established order of things, knowing all the things that you know, um, unless you were stupid. And you wouldn't do it successfully, because successful usually means that you actually understand the obstacles that you're up against, unless you're a very stupid person. And so knowing a lot of very successful entrepreneurs, I can say that we all fall pretty much into that category of people who, who wake up in the morning, understand all of the things that stop us from doing the things we want to do, and then go try to do it anyway. Um, so I thought today, rather than take you through a deeply factual talk about climate change, I'd take you a little bit through an emotional journey on climate change. Um, I'll begin with, with, with the factual background. I have lots of slides that I could take you through, and I'll, I won't take you through any of them. You'll be relieved to know. I'll just tell you what they say. So I'm, I'm going to show you lots of charts, and those charts are going to tell you that there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere, um, that we need to cut the CO2 in the atmosphere from some quite large number to what seems like still a fairly large number, but the magnitude of the cut is very dramatic, 60 gigatons to 20 gigatons, depending on your point of view. Um, and that if we don't do it, the impacts are going to be very bad. Um, depending on where you live, I'll tell you about sea level rise, or I'll tell you about deforestation, or I'll tell you about effects in the sea. It's all very bad. And in fact, the biggest problem is that the impact, I, I, I was on the same ship that Sylvia was on, and we had 20 scientists with us, and, 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 and they tried to do the opposite. They, we had 20 scientists, each of whom presented their perspective of what was bad. And the problem is that from almost any way you look at it, it's very bad. And the most, the most troubling thing is what happens is the natural system becomes completely unreliable. And, and, and the natural system is designed to be reasonably reliable, to be a system. You start to take those pieces apart, and things start to work very, very uh, dramatically poorly. Um, so that's the first part of the talk. We have a problem. We're in trouble. Um, we're not taking it seriously enough, and we're not doing anything about it fast enough. The second part of the talk is that there is hope. Over the last, let's call it 10 years, but really intensively in the last five years, a lot of resources have been spent on trying to show us roadmaps to how we could go from a high carbon world to a low carbon world. And depending on your point of view, you can look at the McKinsey roadmap. The McKinsey roadmap is deeply analytic. People spend a lot of money doing it. You can parse the economy into little tiny slices. You can see exactly what the response is in each of the areas. And you can start to feel better about things. Um, we at the, I, I started a foundation in Europe called the European Climate Foundation. We spent about $15 million taking apart the European power system to see whether you really could build a zero carbon energy system logically. We involved all of the major utilities, all of the grid operators lots of logical consulting groups and so forth. And the answer was, not only could you do it, but the end GDP in Europe is higher in 2050 than it would be in a high carbon energy system. So actually, the news is not so grim. There's a, there's a pathway, there are things we could do, and there's a direction to go. The reality, of course, is that the, the distance between the pathway and what we actually do is very, very dramatic. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that it's just very hard to do. You need to change aspects of the economic system across virtually every industry, every sector, every way we interact with our economic and natural world. Some of the changes are relatively small. Some of them are huge. But, but only doing part of them doesn't help you. You need to do it all. Um, to illustrate it, and I, I work on this a lot, I hear all sorts of statistics, but someone said to me uh, about a year ago, um, probably what to me is the most fascinating one, if you take the global economy and you project it forward, taking the numbers that most people accept is the direction that we're supposed to go, or we're likely to go if you, dis if you don't account for the effects of climate change, and then you take global population growth, and you, and you actually look at a, a, a CO2 output per unit of economic growth that we are now projecting we'll have in, in 2050, you go from a CO2 output per unit of economic growth of 768 today to a required CO output 
per unit of economic growth in 2050 of 8. So you have to go from 768 to 8. If we do that, we're fine. So only about a hundredfold decrease, um, which is a fairly dramatic number. Um, and what's, what's fascinating about working on climate change is that if you go and you sit down with most of the, of, of the thoughtful policymakers in the world, particularly in China, Germany, Europe, to a degree even the United States, most people kind of accept most of that math. And so what we're left with is a very interesting emotional problem. And so now I'll stumble into a joke because the joke – to me, sort of explains it. I heard this when I was young, and it's one of those, I don't remember jokes very well, but this one's always stuck with me. You've got two people sitting on a plane, and, and they're, the flight's eight hours long, and the pilot comes on and, and, and announces that they've lost an engine. And so now they're going to be just fine because the plane flies just fine on three engines, but it's going to take them nine hours to get there. And that's fine, and they think the two guys say, well, that's a little bit longer to drink. We're having a good old time to speed the joke along, the next announcement, sorry, we've lost another engine, but no problem at all. We can make it on two engines. It's going to take us a little longer now. The flight's now going to be 14 hours, but, you know, we have to fly a little more slowly, but we'll be just fine. And then finally, a little while later, the pilot comes out and he says, we've lost a third engine. Now the flight's going to take us 20 hours, and, you know, and, 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 but that's all right. We, you know, we, can, we can fly this plane on one engine. You have nothing to worry about. And one guy turns to the other and says, I hope they have enough alcohol, because if they lose another engine, we're going to be here all night. <laughs> And that's kind of what you feel like if you're working on climate change. You sit through these meetings in which global disaster is predicted, and everybody says, okay, that's fine. Now, what, is there any coffee here? Um, and, and the truth is that we have a very, very hard time internalizing this. So I speak now before more and more groups around climate. I, I didn't do a lot of speaking. I used to just work at the policy level, and now I work a lot actually at the investment level. I try to move capital into low-carbon investments. And, and I can tell you we have a, a very interesting and increasingly real choice. The choice is to do path A, and path A is the difficult choice. It's to figure out how you combine complicated policy responses with the development of new technologies and business models and, and, and economic systems with, 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 with the massive deployment of capital. To solve this problem on the roadmaps I was talking about earlier, you can get there on those roadmaps, but you have to deploy about three times as much capital as we're deploying today. So trillions and trillions of dollars going in one direction instead of another. All very, very complicated to do. Require lots of analysis, lots of persistence, um, and, and a willingness to take some experiments and, and, and even potentially to risk some failure in some things. Um, but but it's, in, it's in the hard work category. But there is another path, so we don't all need to worry too much. I, I, I was just out in, in, in Silicon Valley, and in Silicon Valley, you talk to people who, who are really feeling pretty good about the other path. And the other path, they, they actually now have a movement around it, and they have a, a, a whole university they've developed around it. It's called Singularity. And, and effectively what it says is that we really don't have to worry too much about this, because by 2050, we won't need our bodies anymore. We won't need to be human. We will live entirely digitally. That's, that, that's our future, because we won't have a planet left to live on. And luckily, there are all these fantastic digital networks which are going to embody all of our personalities, and we can become virtual, and who really wants to live in a body anyway? Who wants to live in an Earth anyway? And the problem is that there are lots and lots of people under the age of, let's call them 20, and it's even 25, who are starting to think that this is the right option. Because the choices that we are leaving them on the, hey, let's do the real work, let's engage around the complexity, let's try to solve the problem, those choices are getting smaller and smaller every day, and we aren't doing the real work. And so we're leaving that generation with no option. I mean, the, you know, the dirty secret here that, yeah, there's a CO2 budget and we're, we're, you know, we're, we're taking away more and more of it every day, all the choices that we make just actually leave us with fewer and fewer choices. That is, th that is going to create a reality where our only way out of it is just to say we actually can't live in humanity anymore. We can't live on the earth. We, we, we have to start embracing a different reality. It's not the reality I live in, by the way. I'm almost 50. But, but it, it may be the only path because truthfully very few of us are engaging around this problem with the seriousness and the persistence and, 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 and with the sense of complexity that we would need to. And, and we're only going to have two choices. 
So it's nice to say, yeah, we really should do a little bit more or, or maybe in the next election or whatever it is. But, but actually the people who we're leaving that choice with are going to have no choice but to go the other way. So that's my note of hope. Um, it's not very helpful for me because I'm not going to live very well digitally anyway. But, but I'm afraid, you know, we're down to three engines and we don't have enough drinks on the plane. Um, and so it's not going to be fun to lose the fourth engine. Um, and if we don't do something about that fairly soon, in fact, we may discover that the plane doesn't actually just take longer to get there. If we lose the fourth engine, something else really bad happens. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Uh, when we live digitally, were we allowed to choose who we are? No, no, <laughs> um, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if, I, I love the line about optimi about um, uh, entrepreneurs being stupid, and I, I wonder if optimists are also stupid. Um, um, I tend to think people are either optimists or pessimists uh, genetically, but um, <laughs> hearing, uh, hearing these panelists and hearing uh, people who are so smart uh, talking, talking about these things, uh, really does give me a sense of optimism because it just makes me think that we've got to be able to think our way out of, out of this somehow. Um, normally as a moderator I would uh, think up a lot of questions to ask in case no one uh, who comes has questions but I know that that's not necessary for this group. So uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes and we've got a question over here. Uh, this gentleman right here. Thank you, uh, Michael Clare. Uh, so I think uh, I'm responding to everybody, but I'll, I'll take off where, where you finish, George. And I, I think there'll be a different reality. I think what's going to happen is that a lot of people are simply going to stay in denial about climate change. And so the plea for the United States to, that Martin made to embrace the problem, is, it's not going to happen, at least not, not for the foreseeable future. Uh, and, and other large bodies are not going to change. They're just not. Uh, on the other hand, other people are. Mm -hmm. So I can envision a future, not the one you have, but where you have parts of the world yes. that are, do make tremendous mm -hmm. adaptations and others that don't. So that's more likely what the planet is going to be like, where, where places that are, are quite mm -hmm. adapted. So th the question is, what, what does that mean for the planet? Can we... Should we try to develop a strategy to multiply the places that, are, that, that adapt to make them a constellation that work together? Should we be talking, I, I started talking about breaking up the United States. I think that might be a solution. New England should, and, and, and the Pacific Northwest and California should break away because they have the, they will, if they, were, if they did, they would make the, the changes that Martin and the others have spoken to, the, uh, and maybe Chicago. Other parts of the country are not going to do it, not in the, not in the real t term. And I'm, there are parts of Europe that will make that. So is that, a, is that a strategy? That is boosting, expanding the number of places that actually will make the necessary change? Are you talking about the United States or uh, the world? Or the world. What? Martin, Sorry. would you like to take a oh. shot? Uh, I'll have a go uh, at that, um, having sounded rather pessimistic because I ran out of time, let me just tell you that all over the world huge efforts are already being made with conspicuous success. And we're always told that if you are responsible for energy and environment it's too expensive and it reduces your competitiveness and that has been proved to be nonsense. Uh, the Korean government has, is moving into an area of environmental technologies coupled with information technologies, not because they're trying to solve problems, but because they think it's the best way of developing export markets. The Chinese government has defined a remarkable climate change strategy. They didn't just stick it in a corner and give it to the Minister of Environment. They set up a leading group of 17 ministers chaired by the Prime Minister and supported by the National Development Reform Commission, which is the big gorilla so that the issue of response to climate is a nationwide integrated part but of parts all their of strategies. Are, are not going to so do that. that there are all over the world good things happening even in the corporate sector there are many corporations and many cities which have proved that this can be done so it's not a bad story the problem is 
as a, as a, to face a global challenge, there are certain things you need to do as a global community. That's our problem. Uh, and they will go ahead at all these local levels, but there are a lot of intricate delicacies which they argue about interminably, and there's a certain need for a certain level of international collaboration to solve this problem. But I think what you're going to see, and that is my final point, quite apart from climate, there is a massive restructuring in progress in the world economy and in the balance of power across the world, as we all know. That is going to have repercussions for how we start to solve problems. And you may even see at Rio Plus 20 new coalitions forming based on the BRICS with the support of the European Union and others, and the whole world will start to move in a different direction. So I think we are going to see a more pluralist solution to this. And my hope is, and I repeat my appeal, that when the US works out that this is good for the United States and that everybody else is doing it anyway, then they will come along very fast. Sylvia, did you want to say something? Yeah, just a quick com comment here. That exacerbating the CO2 issue, exacerbating these changes that are taking place, is the loss, the, the undermining of the basic systems that do the heavy lifting, that, that work, that make the planet function. So the natural systems, we, we think of protecting uh, like national parks as a luxury. We think of it as an option. But in fact, it's vital that we keep, we really protect the way the world works. And so there are some signs of hope in some of the Pacific countries. A little bit of land and a lot of ocean. They're recognizing the blueness of their countries. Actually, there's a blue United States that's twice as big as the land part. Australia, there's a blue <laughs> Australia. You know, the continental shelf, the out 200 miles, the exclusive economic zone. They're beginning to wake up that this matters. So Australia is announcing a million square kilometers of the Coral Sea for protection, about half of it fully protected, the rest of it managed, with the idea that nature matters. They're beginning to account for nature in a way that hasn't been done until now. Right now, a tiny fraction of 1% of the ocean is safe for fish and other ocean wildlife, where we don't aggressively go after them. A little more than 1% now has some form of protection. That means that 99% is up for grabs. And it's not going to work unless we do, on a broader scale, what the Cook Islands is also doing, and Palau, and even Bermuda is looking to scale up enormously their protection in their waters. But here's an off-the-wall kind of idea that is getting some momentum. About half the ocean, more than half actually, is in the high seas. There's a move afoot now to sort of declare it the blue nation. I mean, I know. Look, we've got all this law that governs the world, but the high seas, it's sort of the Wild West. It's where, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting goes on for generating oxygen, grabbing carbon. Shouldn't it be a global public trust? It's our life support system, after all. It's the blue heart of the blue heart of the planet. I mean, what, how much of your heart do you want to protect? A fraction of 1% is not good enough. 1% isn't. Some say 10% of the ocean should be protected by 2020. Others say 20%. We have a big job to do. But what about this idea of the high seas as something that everybody has a vested interest in taking care of the way the world works? It's an idea that's going to perhaps get splashed out there at Rio. We'll see. George? Michael, let me just try to address your question directly and very simply. The answer is yes. You want to go after each little piece and think that each little piece matters. And that the interconnectedness of it, if you can't solve that, you, you, you walk away from that for a period of time. So, for example, you know, in the United States, a big thing around, well, how much renewables can we really handle on our grid? It's an overwhelming problem. This summer, Germany will have enough renewables deployed to supply 100% of their peak power in the middle of a summer day when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. It, you, you stop an American utility executive, you say, that's not possible. Um, and so what will happen is the Germans will figure this out, and then eventually the Americans will learn it. 
And the only reason that that lesson will cross the border is because guess what? Germany is still working as an economy, looking pretty good right now. And so eventually people will come to understand that models that work in one place work in another. I, I feel very strongly that that definitely will happen and that every little bit of progress matters. The question is whether it will happen in time. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 if you if you step back and you say the only answer to this is to systematically solve the problem, then at the moment, given the way the world system works, we're cooked. So you might as well pick off little pieces. You know, all I do right now, I invest in industrial energy efficiency. It's really narrow but really deep. Um, you know, I, that's my little thing. But if we all do that little thing instead of thinking we have to solve the system, then actually I think we can make some progress. And maybe progress is going to be insufficient or too late. But it's better than no progress at all. Okay. Any other questions? Back here? Or d does anyone have a all right. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much. John Oldfield with WASH Advocates. I work on water and sanitation uh, challenges around the world. Getting back to something that Dr. Lutz mentioned in the, the demographics there, sort of think gaming this out linearly, you know, to increase uh, to decrease population growth rates, to decrease poverty. It means increasing education, means increasing child survival. I'd like to give you a chance to sort of go through any of the solutions that you probably didn't get a chance to talk about. What are the policy recommendations? How can those of us in the developed world help that challenge? How can those prime ministers and finance ministers in developing countries, all of whom want to prioritize the survival of their own children, how can these folks, what are the specific policy recommendations that your uh, demographic studies might, might lead us to? Martin? I mean, uh, Wolfgang, yeah. sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, um, thank you. <laughs> I have the two of you. There's a, a neuron it's a short circuit. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the question that indeed uh, gives me an opportunity to say something I didn't have the time uh, to say there. Um, I mean, education has, in our Western rich societies, been really the foundation of our. Well, I did my dissertation on a country, Finland, which in the late 19th century was the poorest corner of Europe. People were starving there. A quarter of the children died in 1868. And they had nothing to sell, no natural capital, nothing. They just invested in making their population literate. And today, as we all know, Finland is one of the most competitive societies. And uh, I've showed pictures about Korea that did it. So this is a, a policy that all our successful today rich countries had. Why aren't we uh, recommending this in the same way, universal broad-based education rather than just elitist education of a few privileged as an international development strategy? It's interesting, most of the books that have been written over the last decade on how to refocus international development efforts and so they, they come up with all kinds of good or sometimes not so good proposals, but I didn't find any of these uh, to really put a significant emphasis on universal basic education. And if you look in the OECD, OECD statistics of international official development assistance, it's only between about 2 and 4 percent of all the aid money that goes to developing countries that goes into basic education. Because much of it is uh, in roads and infrastructure. Well, I don't know why this is the case. Probably you know better than me, but it probably has to do with uh, companies that uh, rather want to export uh, machinery or whatever. Education may not be as, as sexy as a, as a topic for development assistance. And also, possibly, uh, it's thought that this is really the responsibility of the local governments themselves, and there's a truth to it. And in, in a partnership, uh, of course, uh, this uh, needs to be done jointly, I would say. So uh, my conclusion of really trying to study more than 25 years uh, using the quantitative tools of systems analysis, really studying how population trends interact with economic change, economic development, growth, and all the environmental constraints in many case studies around the world. Um, in the end result of, this, of all these many investments that you can make, uh, probably, as, as Benjamin Franklin already said, an investment in your mind, in your brains, always pays, pays the best interest. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Twitter. Uh, this question is from the user Mavis Inc. And sort of going off these solutions you've discussed, uh, how do we get these funds diverted to to come up with these sustainable solutions? What are the best means of, of doing so? What are the best means of coming up with sustainable solutions that we've been discussing? 
No, did you say yeah. funding? Money. Funds, he said. Funding. Money. Capital. Funding. 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 funding yes. Should answer that. George, I guess I get a shot. I just what I do all day long. Um, look, the answer is uh, there's some people doing this extremely well. Uh, the Germans do this extremely well. The Chinese are starting to do this extremely well. Um, and, and some other people do it rather poorly. Um, the, the two possible responses that people have had in order to bring these solutions in economically is either to subsidize a solution or to lower the investment transaction costs and risks. The subsidy route is a problem because you run out of money. Um, and so in Europe, in Spain or in Italy, where you had not otherwise terribly strong economies and people put in big subsidies around, for example, renewables deployment, but there, could, but there are lots of other things people have subsidized. Um, very quickly when the economic crisis happened, those regimes became unstable and or investors didn't trust them and so it, it became even more expensive to, to do. The better thing for governments to do, which is what the Chinese and the Germans have done, is they've said, we believe in our own policy regime, so we, we, we will make low-cost capital available to people who are willing to invest in this um, and, and, and bring the cost of capital down, which, which has the same effect as putting in place a subsidy, it, but, it, but it aligns the government's interests with the investor's interest. It makes people feel good about the policy regimes. It's one of the reasons why if you invest in a solar project in Germany, you get 7 or 8% or 6% return, and people line up around the block to do that. And if you invest in a solar project in Italy, you get a 15% return, and it's hard to find people who want to do that. Um, if the government is aligned with you, it's much better. So generally speaking, finding ways where the government shares the risk with you is a good idea, as opposed to finding ways where the government is apparently subsidizing you, and therefore the government is spending lots of the money they don't have, where probably you'll find yourself in a position where that becomes economically and, and politically unsustainable. So, I mean, I can go into lots of detail around that, but if, in those two categories, find ways that the government gets at risk with you and lowers the cost of capital, rather than that the government throws lots of money at you in ways that aren't sustainable in the long term. I think you exceeded your 140 character limit. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> um, would you, do you have something to add? Well, yeah, yes, I'd just be to make, definitely make, don't tweet. make a simple <laughs> point that at the moment, fossil fuels are subsidized across the world you can take your pick, but somewhere between 500 billion and a trillion dollars a year. So we're subsidizing the use of fossil fuels, which is not clever when we know that fossil fuels are going to wipe us out if we carry on. Some earlier speaker said we're addicted to oil, which is true, because our civilizations are built on it. And at the moment, in the European Union, fossil fuels are subsidized roughly $40 a ton against solar and renewables. So if you don't have a level playing field, if you do not have a situation where new and renewable energy sources have equal chance, then you have got a distorted market and the magic of the market is working in the wrong direction. So this is why there's such an international interest in putting a price on carbon. And if we don't do that, we're not going to solve the problem. The Chinese are about to do it very likely. The Californians are doing it. It's not rocket science and it's difficult, it does work, and that's the only way we're going to get a chance to find these new solutions. Sylvia. Fish are carbon-based units too, <laughs> like trees. And we're subsidizing commercial extraction yeah. of fish and other ocean wildlife. According to Robert Zoellick at a conference that took place in Singapore that The Economist hosted, five billion dollars a year loss it's a losing proposition, even with between 25 and 50 million billion dollars of subsidies to prop up this unsustainable extraction mm -hmm. of wild things from the sea, allegedly to feed people. So food security is something we haven't touched on, yeah. but it is a critical issue. And we can't look to wild creatures as a source, a long-term, even a short-term source, a viable source of food for people as a luxury maybe at some level, but not to feed seven billion people or even a billion, you know, it just isn't working. So subsidies, big problem on many fronts. Mm -hmm. Okay, capital, well, uh, real quick. Well, uh, the question was for cost, and I just wanted to point out, that, as you have said, that many of the right things actually don't cost anything, and some of them have a negative cost. You save money by yes, doing yes. it. So the question is, why don't we do it? It's it very simple, because we are stupid. Oh. We don't, <laughs> <laughs> we don't no. use our brains that God has given us well enough. We need to think harder. And by the way, brain power is zero emissions yeah. power. Yes. It is almost <laughs> I, I, very good.
I, 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 yeah. have, I have to say that it isn't just because we're stupid, it's because there are very powerful interests vested in the existing system. And unless you have the political courage to take these people on and push through these changes, no amount of intelligence or policy analysis or research results is going to make the slightest difference. And that's where we're stuck. We have okay. Twitter power now. <laughs> we have time maybe for one more question. Is, a, is there right here? <laughs> I'm Phyllis Bennis from the Institute for Policy Studies. Can I cheat and ask two short ones? Oh, uh, just go ahead. Okay, so one question would be on this issue of the powers that profit. Let's use the term profit because that's what it's about. There is too many forces that make a huge profit from the current systems mm -hmm. of energy, et cetera. What are your thoughts, as people who work in that world, of how to challenge that existing power? That's question one, the easy one. <laughs> the second one is whether we should be looking at normative approaches to this. And I'm thinking particularly of what's rising in places like Ecuador and Bolivia, although not only there, uh, the notion of the rights of the earth as a, an extension of human rights, so that we look at the rights of not only preparing for a future where we could protect the Earth that we need, that we, we need the protection of carbon emissions to be lowered, et cetera, but also the rights of the Earth. Is that a viable long-term approach to seeing how we can change this whole dynamic? Okay, uh, we'll give the rights, I think, yep, I think, mm -hmm. Sylvia, I think you're, you're, you're the one. Well, but I also want to say George has, I think, an answer to your first question. Make it pay to do things the right way. You know, it should be profitable to do it, a low-carbon thing instead of a high-carbon. I mean, that's what you're doing. It's making <laughs> solutions that are, that are attractive financially as well as being the right way to go. Yeah, I, mean, I think the interesting thing about your question is basically you, 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 you bookended the question uh, or the issue, right? I mean, clearly one opportunity is to change the way the system works. Um, so, yeah, and the very end of that is to say the earth has rights. Um, and and, and that, that ultimately is the direction one has to go to and whether one gets there directly or indirectly. I think it's a very hard route. Um, I know some people, along with Sylvia, who are doing some very interesting things around that. And, you know, and the legal system can be used in odd ways. You know, Al Capone didn't go to, go to prison for killing people. Um, and so, you know, there are odd things that you might be able to do. And some of the, some of the strategies that are emerging are quite brilliant. But they're going to take a while. It's going to be tricky. And, and, of course, this is a global problem and where you can enforce those rights and so forth. At the very other end of it, you know, the weird thing is that, you know, to take Wolfgang's phrase and make it even worse, right, we really are stupid because it isn't only that we have better financed opponents. It's actually that the inertia in our economic system stop us from doing things which, in fact, nobody even minds if we do. We are just don't, you, not used to doing it. Um, and so there are large categories of perfectly profitable investments. I mean, I, so I said I, I invest in industrial energy efficiency. You go into a large a plant that uses a lot of heat, and they have a big fat smokestack and they put it all up, on, uh, you know, all up into the sky. You take that stuff, you use it to boil water, you run a steam turbine, and you generate electricity. And you give that electricity back to the plant, and he's saved money. Everybody's happy. That should be the easiest thing to do in the whole wide world, except it's not. Because the guy who runs the plant, that's a lot of trouble. And anyway, the local utility doesn't like it because he used to buy the power from them. And so there are lots, every one of these changes has a thousand little problems you have to work your way through. The only way you really work your way through that in our current system is people make money working your way through it. And so you try to create an economic incentive process where enough people can, in fact, engage around this with enough resources, with enough sense that there's, a, that there's an economic payoff at the end, that they try to change the way the order works. Um, and so, you know, I, I, still do work, I still do a lot of work on policy, but most of my work now is to try to motivate the economic system to reward people who do the right thing and to a degree punish the people who do the wrong thing. I mean, you know, this subsidy issue is a very real issue and, and it's a very nice thing to aim at because, in fact, you know, it is, just to take a simple example, it is more expensive to ensure the creation of an energy plant in a steel mill in Michigan than it is to ensure a mile deep um, oil rig in the middle of a tossing sea because the insurance in one is subsidized and the insurance in the other is not. Um, and so there are, there, there are lots of perverse little details that you have to, have to deal with. But, but I, I think, I think the, you know, the, the answer to the one is very simple. Just 
block and tackle around the day-to-day -day economic challenges around trying to make each of those things work and trying to expose how much money the other guys get for doing the other thing. At the very other end, it's a very complicated, long-term change in our legal framework around how we look at our natural resources. And I think p people are working on both. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know which one will win in the end. Okay, we're uh, almost out of time, but Martin wants to get a real quick comment in. Yeah, I fear that I do. I think we cannot escape the fact that there are issues of power and interest driving this whole process. Putting prices on things is clever, but it isn't going to change that fact. Jared Diamond's book on the collapse of civilizations explains why they collapse, not because they're stupid, but because they don't make the changes in time. We're exactly in that position. And nobody has said the word common property or public goods. What Sylvia is talking about is public goods, which are not within the management capacity of anybody at the moment. The atmosphere is a public good. All the things we're worried about. And in the good old days, until 30 years ago, we used to believe that governments were the custodians of public goods. And until governments free themselves up sufficiently to say this far and no further, that's your normative point, we're not going to solve these problems. So I think there's a very major problem under the surface of governments standing firm and saying there are the normative conditions under which you can operate. And by the way, the business people are always saying we need clear, transparent signals. If we give them them, I think we can solve this problem. Okay. 30 Go ahead. seconds. <laughs> it's just all of the religions in the world, the major ones anyway, have as a, an ethical streak mm -hmm. through them about a stewardship yeah. attitude. And they have a lot of other things too, but there is that, this caring for, for nature, if you will, caring for one another. And that's reason for hope, perhaps, as we understand that our future is absolutely reliant on the natural systems that keep us alive, things that we took for granted because we could a century ago. Now we know they're at risk and therefore we're at risk. So whatever the reason, making peace with nature is fundamental to making peace with ourselves. And I am an optimist. I mean, there are people with poetry, people with art, people with song have a way of touching our hearts in ways that even if you don't get it with your brain <laughs> directly, there may be ways to see our way through to huh, a sustainable world. What a concept. <laughs> okay, Very that's a good. really good Super. place to end. <laughs> <laughs> that's a wrap. I'm going to send you I, I want to thank the, the panelists brothers. very much for coming, Talk and brothers. I want to thank the oh, conference oh, organizers oh. and supporters, yes. and I want to thank you in the audience for participating and asking your really great, great questions. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Don't go away yet. We're going to take uh, just hold it for a moment. Some closing things here. Um, <clears throat> you know, Fred, you started off by talking about a, a mass extinction event. You've written a book on the fate of the species, and you insisted on telling us to pre-order at Amazon. Do you know something we don't know? <laughs> Jeez. No, I don't. <laughs> Good. All right, fine. Uh, George, I have to say that you picked up something we spoke about this morning when you talked about looking at small individual projects and getting them going. We were talking earlier about local solutions to global problems um, and doing it from a bottom-up point of view, which, of course, engages your other characteristic, the entrepreneurial one. Here I must tell you my story, which was that when we started our business, we used to tell people we were too stupid. Uh, what was it we said? Uh, we were too stupid to do what was impossible. <laughs> basically, what we're saying is we were, all Cass we were Cassandras because we were going the contrarian route. But we were too stupid to know what we were trying to do was impossible. <laughs> Think about it. That was the extension of your point. Anyway, um, that was a wonderful panel. Thank you very much indeed, Fred. Thank you. Um, I just need to make a few house housekeeping announcements. One is a pleasure, which actually I'd forgotten until I was reminded, but there's a reception after this that starts as you get out of the door. Secondly, don't lose your badges. Take them with you to bring them back when you come in tomorrow, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, and then Susan and Stephen, you left your credit cards at the bookshop. You know who you are. All right? <laughs> we can all order some books then. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you.
Well, Sylvia, okay. can I say it's a great honor to meet you? Oh, I know. standing up for. Yeah.